All right, no video today. No. I wore a tie too. It's never. It's not even going to be recorded. Yeah. Well, I guess what's my. What's 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 the tie? You're quite, dapper. quite dapper. Yeah. You want an A in this class? Oh. No. I. What? Do you think that's like a? It's it's kind of like a drug deal actually, <laughs> because he 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 brought me Hawaiian coffee and he was like, here. Oh. Aha. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to CSC 53, 23, 73, 23, Mobile Sensing Learning and Control. This is lecture 24, the second to last lecture of the semester. Um, you guys chose to do a lecture on speech processing today, so today we're going to talk a little bit about speech processing. Uh, I'm going to start off very computer science oriented. We're going to talk about API usage. Um, on how you would do speech recognition and speech processing on iOS, and then we're going to go and we're going to explore some feature space and talk about how speech recognition is done. Um, and we're also going to talk about fingerprinting audio, right? So if you had a final project and part of your final project was identifying um, sounds, we're going to talk a little bit about how you might actually uh, fingerprint those sounds and send them up as features, what the right features would be. So do not forget, on Friday, this man, Mr. John Carmack, is going to be here um, 4 to 5.30 in Vester Hughes. Get there early because I am almost assured it will be uh, standing room only inside there. So this would be a great talk to go to. Course logistics. Okay, A6 grades are coming. Um, I'm hoping to do them over the weekend because I'm going to be on a plane um, for a lot of time. Um, so essentially, hopefully when I get back on Tuesday, A6 grades will be done and all, all I'll have to do is post them up. Um, I'm going to do proposal feedback first. However, I think I've gotten everyone. Has anyone not received feedback on their proposal? I sent it via email. Good. Awesome. Um, so next week there is no class. Uh, I'm going to be on a plane this Friday and uh, I'm going to be gone and I'm coming back on Tuesday. So my office hours on Friday and Monday will be non-existent. So uh, email me and I can email you back in the evening hours about things that we'll have. Wednesday, I will be around. I will come here during class time. I will be here during lab time if people are here and they have questions and they're working on final projects. So I will be around for that. Um, other than that, final projects are coming up here in what, two, two weeks? We'll demo in two weeks. Two weeks from today. Exactly two weeks from today. Should be great. Yeah. So look at the requirements for the final project. I think everyone sent the constraints in there and, and we're going to be good to go. So I took everything that's on the website and kind of distilled it down into bullet points. Um, so final project demonstration time, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, um, each team. Uh, and I want you to demonstrate your finished application to me and give me your elevator pitch. All right, I want to know the elevator pitch for your app. Right. So if you were, you guys know what an elevator pitch is? That's uh, that is a, a very pessimistic view of an elevator pitch, but yes, that is that's essentially what what it is, right? A very quick, very high level view uh, of what your application does and why it's important, right? So I want you to give me that uh, next Monday's lecture. Not this coming Monday, but it's going to be completely about doing that pitch. Okay, actually, it'll be about doing a presentations in general, but that'll be part of it. Um, you'll show me the design constraints that you can show me from your proposal during demonstration time. Um, so if you can show it, be prepared to, um, or have a video, something that I can look at to see that something is working, all of, all of the constraints that you have, right? If you guys have questions about that, how you would show it during demonstration day, let me know, all right? You guys are going to have a keg, which is fun. We'll just fill it with water, though. 
I'm pretty sure that, I'm pretty sure SMU is a dry campus. But actually, I don't know that for sure. There's undergrads in here, so I don't think we can do that anyway. Is that actually a matter? I think even if you have undergrads, yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know. My my old college was not. You could you could host it and have a you could do whatever on campus, like right after class. So I don't know. Um, I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna ask you guys one question. Um, at least one. You know, the team. I will ask you questions, and at least each team member must answer one of those questions. Um, and should be fine. Um, the web page and video that you guys are going to make um, should concisely explain uh, essentially the aspects of your elevator pitch, right? So have an introduction of the project, uh, display your design constraints, um, specific details of your implementation that I would need to know, right? So this is the machine learning that we use, these are the problems we ran into, and this is what we did to solve it, right? So it's a little more technical than what you'd see on a, a, a Kickstarter. Um, a video giving me a compelling story of the project. I know that you guys are not um, cinematographers. That's fine. Just shoot a video and post it. Okay. Um, give me a summary of each team member's contribution um, in in your guys's own words. Right. I, I expect you guys to divvy up the project among team members. Let me know what everyone did. Okay. Everybody's getting the same grade on the final project. Okay. It is sink or swim together. Okay. If someone isn't doing that well on the team, too bad. Okay. Manage better. All right. Welcome to real life. All right. I hate to do that to you here, but um, I didn't build anything into the syllabus to grade differently, so I couldn't do anything if I wanted to. Okay. Unless everybody agreed and we signed something. Okay. So everybody gets the same grade. But I still want to know what everybody did because it'll help me ask questions. Okay. Agenda. Today we're going to talk about speech processing. Very quickly, we're going to talk about speech recognition uh, using an API, kind of what that processing overview looks like for using the, the API that we have for Apple. Um, and then I'm going to talk about vocal analysis, things like, um, eh, we're going to talk a little bit about pitch, but we're going to talk about speech recognition in general and what the overall methods are that are there. We'll go from uh, signal processing all the way to the machine learning, um, and you'll get a, hopefully an appreciation for why to use an API. All right, good, happiness. Okay, first, let's talk about Google versus Apple. Um, I, I'm gonna put a blanket statement out there that Google has a clear advantage over Apple for speech recognition. Um, I think that shows up in the Google Now app. Uh, I think the, the way that they um, essentially allow you to use their request. Matt, when you did the Google Glass stuff, how easy was it to use their API for voice recognition? What did you have to do? Yeah. But it's essentially, it is built into the Android framework, right? All that speech recognition, and a lot of it runs locally. You don't have to go out HTTP, right? Um, so that's great. That's awesome for Google, not for you guys. Um, so look at Google Glass. You can do speech on Chrome when using the Chrome browser. Browser, um, You can do speech recognition with it with using their API. Um, you can use a Google Search API with iOS. You can. However, it is not actively supported, nor is it documented on how to use it with iOS. Um, so you're kind of at the mercy of whoever created it. Uh, not only that, but uh, Google likes to change things every once in a while so that whenever somebody comes out with a stable version for using the Google Search API, it quickly changes for iOS and you can't really use it all that well. Um, so essentially it's this. There's Apple and then there's Android. This is you. Okay, and you kind of have to deal with it right in between where you are, right? Google doesn't want uh, Apple and iOS being able to use all the stuff that they put a lot of time into that they are exposing for Google Glass, at least not immediately. But what does Apple have that Google does not? Siri. Siri. 
Oh, the fun-loving personal assistant that we have at Apple from Siri. Siri is great. Siri does wonderful, wonderful speech recognition, right? So does Google, right? I can talk. I have friends that have thick accents. I can barely understand some of the English that they say, and Siri gets it 100% no problem, okay? That, that is a huge development. That is great engineering. That's incredible to me. And they 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 come to me and they they talk about it with me They're like, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Right? No Siri. Sorry. You don't get that with Apple. Uh, it's not available to developers. Siri is not. Uh, even for speech recognition. Even if you don't want to use the personal assistant, you just want to get you want to ask Siri what the speech is. Ah, it's not there. Sorry. Can't use it. Every new iOS release as a rumor before it gets released that there's going to be the new Siri API and you're finally going to be able to get access to it and use it. Hasn't happened yet. There's still, like iOS 8, the rumors are already out for, oh, the Siri SDK is coming. Why is it coming? Because they're going to have the iWatch, right? And you're going to have to interact with it in some way. And that may very well be true, but it doesn't exist yet. So let's write our own speech recognition recognizer, okay? No, let's not do that. Don't do this at all. Don't try this unless you really, 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 really know what you're doing. And by the end of this lecture, I think you're going to see why don't ever try and do this on your own. Unless you're, you're trying to recognize like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine digits, right? Something very, very manageable. When you're trying to do the entire English language vocabulary, good luck. It's really, really hard to do right. And um, speech recognition is probably the most mature, mature form of machine learning that exists today. All right, there are 50 years worth of process. The second that a computer came out, they were like, let's do speech recognition. Okay, so it was one of the first things they were trying to do. And not only that, but it builds on linguistics and linguistics goes back hundreds of years on how you wanna actually um, formulate and break down a language. I have had a lot of experience with speech recognition. I've taken four classes on it, and I still have only scratched the surface on everything that exists out there. Okay? All right. So, I lied to you a little bit. You do have speech recognition that's built into Apple. You do. Just not uh, it's, it, it's actually related to Siri, right? It's exposed, and every time you put a text field down or a text view, when you put it down on the storyboard, right? So this right here is a text view, and this is a little text field. You guys have used these before. A lot of you guys have used these before in your, in your apps. When you click on it and the keyboard comes up, as long as you're not on the simulator and you are on an actual device, there's this little microphone down here. Little microphone, and you can click it and it's like, boop. It's waiting for your recording and you can dictate to it and then hit done and it will come back and say done. Okay, that is built in. And if you want to, you get access to that every time you want. If you want to get notifications for when dictation is used by the user, then you need to subclass the UI text view. Okay, then if you want to get notifications about it, you need to post your own notifications every time some dictation happens. So you'll get a notification that says um, dictation did end recording. Right? It hasn't sent it off to the server to find out what the speech is yet, but it finished recording, it's about to send it off, and then when it comes back, you'll get another notification, which is, hey, these are the results that have come back from the, dictation, the dictated speech. Along with that, you have to implement all of the text field protocols. Okay? That means you have to implement 23 different methods that are not related to dictation, so that you can get access to the dictation protocol. These are required methods in the protocol. Yeah. Can you copy paste from the superclass? You can. Okay. Just it just makes your code bloated. And it's buggy as all hell. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you don't get the notification you thought you were going to get. And you just sit there with your thumb somewhere else. The conclusion, it is not yet built for dictation. They do expose it, and it's probably, this is probably the kind of inner workings on how they're going to expose speech recognition with a lot of these same things, but it is not there yet. Um, you can check out this on GitHub. This worked a couple of years ago. I don't even think this voice navigation works anymore, but it does take you through how to subclass the UI text view and get some things to it. You probably have to update all of the code. All right, but with iOS 7, it's 
Anyway, this is not the method I'm going to teach you today. What are our other options? Well, there's something called open ears. We're not going to do it, but I want you to be aware of it. Um, it is limited to U.S. English and Spanish. That's Mexican Spanish, not from Spain Spanish. The same way that this is U.S. English, not Great British English. Okay. Um, it can be a memory hog because everything runs local on the phone. Right? So you do the dictation, it records it, puts it through its model, and spits it back out. But it's fast in the same regard. Um, it's not as accurate as if you were to send that speech off to uh, a server, but it's still pretty good if you're running on the device. If you're running on the simulator, it's not so great because of the sampling rate in the microphone. Okay, And it's free. All right, It does take up a lot of space in your app. Right, It's a pretty hefty protocol, but it's good. I like it. Or the next best thing, you guys ever heard of Nuance? The company, Nuance Mobile, they make Dragon, nat naturally speaking. Yeah. They're also the company that, that licensed out the Siri speech recognition technology. right? So they're the ones behind it that, that did a lot of this stuff. And they licensed it out to Apple when they were creating their own um, speech recognition software. So my thought is that when the Siri API is made available, it's going to be very, very similar to the API that you would use with InDev or Nuance. Right? So how you would use the speech recognition um, from their protocol. So that's what we're going to go over. Okay? All right. So you can sign up for a free account to Nuance. It is a company and they do want to make money. Um, you get up to 500 free utterances per day for developing um, on, I think, 100 devices. Right? So you can go in and say something and it will send it back down as text to you um, 500 times a day without paying for it. Um, there are license agreements for commercial use. Normally, the way that this is used is when you have a company and you're trying to come up with an enterprise solution um, for your company, right? So you're about to, you know, make iOS apps for the company that you're working for, and you push this out and you get something like 2,000 or so many utterances per day so that they can go through like a personal voice assistant, right? They also have something called Nina. It's their version of Siri, um, except a little more powerful, um, and it's a, a personal assistant as well. I forget what Nina stands for, but you guys have Google, so you can figure it out. Or Bing, if Bing. Whatever you want to use. I'm not going to box you. Um, so this is machine learning as a service, is it not? It is. You send recorded speech up to a server, and you get a prediction back that is the text of that speech. Um, in order to use it, they want to make sure that you're paying for it. You get a sandbox ID. You get a host name and a port that you can... Um, post to, and you get an application key because you have to license this for every single app that uses it. All right, you have to pay separately. So your application gets a key that you can use. Um, so Nuance, the way that it works is there's a framework called SpeechKit, right? This is right in the middle right here. And this is essentially a class um, that you, or it's an object that you, that you create and it handles um, all of the audio, it handles all of the networking, it handles all of the encoding, it handles all of the pause detection. So when you're done speaking, you don't have to hit a done button. It detects when there's a pause. Um, and then it will take all of the audio and everything that, that you just created. It will send it up to the server. That's where all of the authentication and recognition happens. You can also do text-to-speech if you want. And then that gets sent back down through SpeechKit back to your app. The two things that are inside of your app are a speech recognizer, it's an one object, and if you're doing text-to-speech, you'll have a vocalizer, which will be another separate object, okay? SK, SK recognizer and SK vocalizer, okay? Here is a more involved view of what all of that looks like, right? So your app does some speech setup, it connects to SpeechKit, and then it does an authentication. Once, once you create the speech kit object, right? Now when you want to do a recognition, you say, hey, I want to recognize something. So it turns on the audio stream. It'll, it'll spit back status messages to you. Then it will detect the end of that audio stream and send it up to the server. Can you guys see the mouse that I have up here? Is that just crazy? Okay, good. Um, and then it will give you a response back, right? 
all of this is going to be done through delegation, right? There's going to be delegate methods that get called at each of these intervals so that you can have access to all of the speech and text that are there. Um, and then if something bad happens, such as you decide to cancel recognition, right, then you'll just send that up to the server and say, hey, stop processing what you're doing. It will stop. And then you'll get results or errors or things like that. There are also things like if it finishes and it can't, um, it can't work out what the error was, it will give you suggestions on maybe hold closer, you know, it'll try and tell you what it thinks is the problem for why it couldn't recognize the speech. All right. Did you guys ever see those shirts when they were first doing speech recognition? Apple, Apple was actually one of the, they were at the forefront, right? And all, they had their whole speech recognizer team and they worked from like 1980s up to the early 90s. And when they were done making their speech recognition software, they all got shirts that said, I helped Apple recognize speech. No? You never saw those? The recognize speech? No? Do you guys know what I'm saying? I'm not saying recognize speech. You know that, right? Oh, it's just not funny? Okay. Wreck a nice beach. Like, wreck a nice beach. Oh, uh, some people are like, ah, it's still not funny. But I, I saw that, and it was really, really funny. Okay? Perhaps I have a poor sense of humor. Okay. So when you want to set up and use SpeechKit, you will import, surprise, surprise, SpeechKit framework. And you'll pull it into your application. Okay? Then you're going to use uh, delegation, right? So let's say you have a view controller and it's called DMR Recognizer. Um, it inherits from UI view controller and it adopts two protocols, the SpeechKit delegate and SK Recognizer delegate. Okay? So we are going to be using SpeechKit which is why we need this, and we're going to recognize speech, which is why we need the recognizer delegate. So the speech kit delegate, um, it defines a protocol where messages are sent to the delegate object once you register with this function called setup with ID. Okay, so essentially what happens here is in view did load, you would call this, um, you would call the class method speech kit setup with ID, and then you would enter your ID. That's not my full ID, by the way. There's a, like a string of like 13 numbers right after that that happen. Um, then you give it the host, right? This is a sandbox that I'm using. I didn't pay for this, right? So I'm in, this is my free developer license, right? So inside of sandbox.nmdp, this is the server I'm going to go up on port uh, 402, okay? And I'm going to set up my delegate as self, right? So to, in order to use this method, I needed to call speech kit delegate, right? Now, once I've done that and I've set myself as the delegate, I get access to this method, which is destroyed. What do you guys think this does? What? No, it tells you when the speech kit object, so speech kit is really just part of my authentication. Speech kit is so that they know I have a license and I'm paying for something so that I can use speech kit. So that's why you have this setup with ID, right? So if that ever gets revoked or the speech kit object ever gets destroyed, you're probably going to want to call setup with ID again. So essentially, that's how you get this delegate method. This is, this is the only method in that protocol. It lets you know if SpeechKit is destroyed somewhere in the application, whether it was running in the background and you need a new one. So you'll get this destroyed method will get called. And inside of that destroyed method, um, that's where you'll probably want to call setup with ID again. You'll call this exact same thing right here, right? Because you want to make sure you always have that, right? So that's the whole SpeechKit delegate. That's where it comes from. It's basically authentication. Okay. So now let's talk about the SK Recognizer Delegate. Um, inside of the SK Recognizer Delegate, you get access to four methods. That you, they're all optional implementations. Um, but you have did begin recording, did finish recording, did finish with results, and did finish with error. Okay, So there will be two separate methods whether or not you get results back or an error back. Right? Um, and then what do you... Yeah, we'll go. So the... The one thing here that you're probably going to be most interested in is did finish with results, right? So that is what this API looks right here. 
Um, recognize your did finish with results. Um, essentially what you get back is an object which is your recognizer and an object which is results. And that's of type SK recognition, right? So both of these are defined in your speech kit, speechkit.h, right? Both of those um, objects. Um, so essentially, um, this speech kit recognizer, that is created as a singleton object. You can only have one of them inside of your app, right? And that's why that, that recognizer, it's going to get passed back and forth. So if you want to get access to it, you don't have to put it inside of your app delegate and call the app delegate and get access to it. It's just going to pass it to that protocol so you can get access to it right there. Um, these recognition results, they have, they're a structured format and there's a lot of methods that go along with SK recognition so that you can get access to not only the phrase that it thinks it is, but also other phrases that it might be that are also highly probable. Okay? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is have a property which is SK recognizer and it's we're going to call it voice search. All right? When we want to instantiate that, I'm going to say voice search equals alloc init with type. Okay? None of this is really new, but now this init with type, I'm going to give it a recording type, a detection type, a language type, and the delegate which is self. Okay? When I give it that delegate self, that means I get access to all of those protocol methods we just talked about. So the second that you call this alloc init, it starts recording. All right, so every time you want to do a new recording, you will call alloc init on the voice search. And then when it's done, you'll set it to nil. All right, so um, this language type that you give it, there's a lot of different languages that are supported. Um, this is US English. Ian underscore US, all right, which was what we'll use unless you wanted me to talk in a British accent. No, I think it would be too slow, and I think I think it's probably better defined by the context of your user, right? All right. So if you're if you I mean, if you're talking in French, then you should you should probably grab the language, the default language of the phone from the settings and oh, use so it here. I was here. thinking for like a universal translator app. Oh, mm, yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. But I don't know that. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's better still defined through a selection, right? I think auto detecting is is assuming that this machine learning can do a little more than it really can, right? I think it's going to, you know, you might speak Italian to it and it's going to, I don't know, that's, well, Italian's still a Latin root, right? So it's going to, it might come back with a lot of different languages with the same Latin root. Was that your wedding ring? Yeah, a lot. All right. Fair enough. That's, that's on tape. Don't show that to your wife. All right. So SK end of speech detection. So the other thing that you give it is a detection type. Um, and you have two options for detection type. It can be a short end of speech detection or long end of speech detection. What do you guys think is the difference? Long pause or short pause? Long pause or short pause. It's when do I stop recording, right? So am I going to say, oh, give me a detection result? Or am I going to, like, read this thing a paragraph that I want it to input, right? So stop recording when there's a pause. Wait for a very long pause, maybe a few seconds. Okay. The recording type is going to be very much related to your end of speech detection type. You can give it a search recognizer or a dictation recognizer type. What do you guys think is the difference here? The practical difference. Right. Yeah. Google actually has this exact same distinction too. If you use the Google the Voice API, um, it's essentially: Do you want to use a machine learning service that is primed and trained for recognizing search results? Right. So that's a much different type of phrasing of English that you use when you're entering something into a search bar than it is when you're just dictating. Right. When you want it to fill in like an email message. Right. And so you're going to tell it whether or not 
what you want the actual thing to come from. Does that make sense? A little bit? Well, what's the, what's the accuracy discrepancy between, like if you're using the wrong one, say you're, you're recognizing some reading out of a novel and you're using the search to recognize it, like what's the, what's the difference in your... It's going to, it's going to come back with, um, like it, it's much more likely to put things together that are sentence fragments for search recognition or to look at popular search items for words that it's unsure about. Whereas the dictation is, it is not going to preface it. It's not going to, it's not going to bias all of the terms with using things like find an image that, da, 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 or, um, I don't know, I don't, whatever the most pop, I don't know what the most popular search is, but um, all of the words that are in the most popular searches are going to be biased to come back over other words. Um, this dictation recognizer is going to be more along the lines of complete sentences. It's going to try and come up with punctuation, which it would not do on the on the search, right? Okay. And come back with with a real kind of text. Well, for the web search, it, it seems like it would be more of an issue of like how long it takes, not the accuracy of the results, right? Yeah, but they've separated it out because you're using a separately trained recognizer that has been trained on phrases that were put into search bars versus just, you know, novellas and articles and things. Okay. Okay. So that's how you initialize things, right? So we've got our SK recognizer. All right. So the second that we call this, it starts the recording process. Okay. So now we're going to go through the recording delegation. First of all, we're going to want to track the state that we're in, right? So let's just define this enum, which is idle initial recording processing. And this TS is going to be the transaction state. That's what we'll give this enum name. You guys are good on enums, yeah? Okay. I never asked, so now I asked. Okay, so the first thing that we get is recognizer did begin recording. Once that happens, I'm going to set the transaction state to TS recording, and maybe I've got a button right here, record button, and I'm going to set the title to recording versus, what was it probably before that? Not recording. <laughs> <laughs> Probably record, right? It's, you want it to be an action. Anyway. Okay, so we change the state, and then anything that we want to do right here, uh, we can do, right? If we want to have some kind of live feedback of the uh, audio volume that comes back, you'd set that up in did begin recording. We'll also get access to recognizer did finish recording, right? We don't have a result yet. It hasn't even sent it off to the web, the interwebs. But it's going to be processing it, right? So we change the state to processing, right? So it's finished the recording. It's about to send all the audio up, right? So anything you might want to do in there, you can do. In this one, we're going to set the title to processing, okay? All right. Now for the fun stuff. Recognizer did finish with error. Yeah, it can happen for all sorts of reasons. Um, so what will happen here is you'll get an error and a suggestion back, and if you want, you can go ahead and put that suggestion inside of a UI alert, right? Notice I have knitted this with a title, could not recognize speech, instead of something like error or suggestion, right? And then I can just put that suggestion message in there, and hopefully they don't have to scroll through it, but maybe they do. Good? And, that's, and then I'll alert show. After that, I set voice search equal to nil. Why? Right. Exactly. Because I'm going to alloc init it whenever I want to do another search. OK. Now, did finish with results. Uh, it's going to come back with the recognizer and the results right here. Um, and I can call results.results. <laughs> Um, and get the count. So essentially, this results, that's the NS array of text, of NS strings that I'm interested in. Did I put some stuff on here? Yeah. So if the number of results is greater than zero, I could fill in some text label with results and grab the first result. This is a method that will grab the search result and it'll return it as an NS string. All right? If the number of results is greater than one, I could NS log all of them right here. Right? So it may come back with something that it, you know, it, if something is very likely as a phrase that you said, there may be two or three phrases that are likely 
it'll return the top one and the other two, right? So maybe you want to use those. Okay. And the way that you would get access to them is I have an ns string here, result string, in results.results. So for every ns string in this array, print it out. Good? Happy? Other likely phrases, I think. Yeah. All right. Nuance demo. This is a demo that I took from their example code. I think it's from 2013. It's does not use automatic reference counting. And the HCI in it, it's going to be really fun to look at. It does say terrible. It does say terrible. I said terrible. All right, here we go. Um, Xcode preferences. Flash projector. Good. OK, here we are. OK, so. Essentially, oh, here's my application key. There you go. So you get it in the video. And there's my trial with all of the numbers and stuff that come after it. I'm actually on port 443. Um, so feel free to use my trial. They don't have my credit card information. Um, one of the things that, we, uh, that I didn't talk about was this um, earcon, right? So they have things they'll actually play different audio files when you hit record or it begins and stops recording. Um, and all of those exist right there. So you can you can you can basically put your own uh, dot waves in there for when you want to do that. Customize it. I won't really talk about it. Um, so when I hit the record button, oh by the way, there's a record button. This is done with a nib. So let's look at what this looks like. Oh yeah, here we go. So there's a record button and a text that you can enter right here. There's a recognition type, whether you're doing search or dictation. Um, there's the language code, so whether or not you're doing um, Ian underscore US, Ian underscore GB, whether you're doing Furfur or DD. Right? So these are really wonderful names. Um, audio level that it comes back with, that's actually going to tell you the audio level, so you can tell whether or not the um, microphone's working. Actually kind of a cool implementation. I'm glad they did that. Um, and then the alternatives. Alternative what? Alternative phrases, but as a user, you would have no idea what that meant. <laughs> and the wonderful, vibrant shades of green atop shades of blue. And red, and red. It's like a Christmas app, really. It's pretty wonderful like that. Um, so you're going to hit this record button, and it's going to uh, kick off everything that happens. So that record button, the first thing it will do is it says, if the transaction state is recording it will stop recording. So it's going to cancel. All right? And it calls it on voice search, right? Which is the same name that we gave it. Um, then it's going to go through here and it's going to put together the detection type, the recording type, and the language type that it wants to use. And it's going to grab all of that from those um, uh, segmentation controls, UI segment controls. All right? I won't really go over exactly how it does that. It does it. Okay. If you choose, um, if you choose search, then the detection type is going to be short, and a search recognizer. Otherwise, it'll be long and a dictation recognizer. So they are inextricably coupled together, <laughs> as they should be. Unless you're doing long searches, I can't imagine why. So at the very end of the record button, after they set up these different variables, they alloc init. Okay, and then you will get recognition didn't begin recording. They change state, change the title, and they update the volume meter right, to show you that it's recording. Did finish recording. They turn some stuff off. Where's the interesting stuff? Here. Uh, did finish with results. It essentially looks a lot like the code that I gave you. They're going to populate the search box with first result. Um, and then the alternatives display, they're just going to add text using this function subarray with range. So it'll add text into this, excuse me, this text view. OK? And then there's also some error handling, which is really poor. Oh, yeah, here we go. Title, error, title, suggestion. Wonderful. Good. OK, so should we run this? 
Um, you know, I wonder if I wonder if I should run this on the simulator because you're not going to be able to see my phone. Ah, but I'm not connected to the internet. Well, I'm going to run it on my phone, and then I'm going to hold it up like this. Wait, hold on. Wait. I can do this. Isn't there a... I can get access to the webcam. How can I do that? Photo booth? Perfect. Oh, there's me and my son. Great. Yes. Perfect. Okay, we'll do it this way. Play. It's opening. Oh, it looks even better on the 5S. Okay, so here it is. So there's the record button. Um, there you can see that there. Yeah. Should probably get rid of this get rid of the status bar. That's okay. Um, so what should we say? How do I fire the UI design guy? So it came back with, how do I fired you are designed? Interesting. How do I resign first responder? Oh, come on. Ah, <laughs> oh, they never implemented resign first responder with touch recognition. Are you sure there's not a specific phase phrase recognizer for that one? I can't even see the other things that were given now. Great. Um, there are. There's other things, but I can't. I can't get access to them because no matter what, that keyboard won't go away. Uh, oh. <laughs> they never resigned first responder for touching off of the text view. I can't hit return either. Um, the one one thing it will do is if I hit record, I thought I saw a resigned first responder inside of that function. So if I click that and then cancel, I wonder if that'll work. Suggestion. Sorry. Speech for wait, what does it say? Sorry, speech not recognized. Please try again. Okay. Uh, and it, it took off the alternative, so I don't know what it came back with. So it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the recognition is pretty good. All right. I don't expect it to get HCI, but it got I fired you. We could do something else. What's something that's like a real search that I might do? A search query. Um, why, why would I ever use Bing? It says, why would I ever use Bing? It also has alternatives. Why would I ever use Pink? <laughs> it's not bad. It's pretty good. This is probably how the Siri Speech API will be used as well. Okay? Machine learning as a service. Okay? I wonder how, I don't know how it works with different dialects, but if Siri is in the indication, then pretty well. Oh, does anybody speak German? You speak French? Come here. Yeah, but they don't have it exposed on here. Okay, give it a shot. Just hit, the, just hit the record button say and say something nice in French. Something. Say something in French. Mm. Not the word something, but just like a phrase. Okay. Um, <laughs> C'est clair, c'est très bien. C'est très bien. I guess, um, yeah, I said this class is very good. And it just got uh, this very good in French. <laughs> and the alternative is say very good. <laughs> so... <laughs> Who speaks German? I know a few high school. I'm barely conversational now. All right, let's hear. This is good. This is great. Is it ready? Yeah, just hit record and then. Ich muss meine Hausaufgabe machen. It only came back with the one. What does that say? <laughs> No, it didn't get it. <laughs> Let me try it again. Ich muss meine Hausaufgabe machen. Wow, 
X Nershman Hasman Gavin. I have no idea what that says. Like, see, now yeah. I now I need a native speaker to tell me <laughs> what it came back with. We could type it into Google Translate. It should have just been I have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we could type it into Google Translate. Here, I'm just going to take a picture of that so that we have that for later because we're going to use that later on. Oh, this is what it did, by the way, in case you're watching the video. Ich Mershman Hasser David Hasselhoff. I don't know what it said. <laughs> I did, but it, it didn't. Okay, so let's kill it. Okay. So that was the nuanced demo. All right, it's pretty nuanced. Okay, so let's talk about, before we get into speech, let's talk about if it's not speech that you want. Let's say you're just collecting sound and you want to fingerprint that sound. What do I, what do I mean by fingerprinting sound? Well, if you've got different sounds that you want to recognize, you want to come up with some kind of feature for that sound, right? You want to come up with some different features that you can uh, either get from the time domain or the frequency domain that'll help you classify that sound, okay? That's what I mean by, that's its fingerprint, right? It's a feature. You want to go, you don't want to send up the entire recording and use that as a feature in machine learning. Why? That's a lot of data, cursed dimensionality, right? You're putting, you're putting a lot of faith that that machine learning algorithm can really go in there. And you're probably going to have to give it a lot of different examples if you're just uploading straight, like even if you're just uploading the FFT, right? You're putting a lot of faith in your machine learning. So we want to distill that down. We want to take it from, in one second, if you're recording 44.1 44 kilohertz, you have 44,000 features. We want to get that down to something like eight. All right? So how do we do that? Well, let's take some statistics. How about the zero crossing rate, right? If your signal is S and you can go from J equals one to M, J here would be every single sample that you have in your time domain. Then you can go from, let's say M is 44,000. You can say the sine of S of J <laughs> minus the sine of the previous value, take the absolute value and sum that up. What will that give you? What do you mean by sign? Uh, like plus, plus or, or minus. Plus or minus. If you were to run this in an array, it's literally just looking, do this, go along in the array, right? If this has the same sign as this, add zero. If they're different, add one. It's gonna, so this will give you the number of times that the signal crosses zero in one second. That's a very quick operation. Okay, so that's one feature you might use. Um, now let's take the FFT. We still don't want to send up the entire FFT of the signal, but maybe we want to do something like this. There's something called spectral entropy. Essentially, what you do is you can take the FFT at different frames in time, right? Right? And you could stack them all together and that would be a spectrogram. You guys remember that? A long time ago? Something? No? No? Let's say you've got some incoming audio. You take the FFT of it. And then you wait. And then you take the FFT again. Right? This would be your first FFT. So this would be F of T equals zero. And this would be F of T equals one. Right? They're both the same length, they're just taken at different, it's different places in time. Is that okay? That's okay. Um, so essentially what you can do is you can take that one FFT vector, and if you go from j equals 1 to n, and <laughs> you multiply it times the log of itself, and sum it up. Right here. What? That's like the entropy rate, except you're not dividing it by the number of samples. That's right, because the number of samples that you're sending is always the same, because the FFT that you're taking doesn't change, unless it unless your window no, size changes. I mean, like each, each FFT you take is a sample, so that's the entropy rate of your entire process, of like all the frames in your process, except you're not dividing it up to get an average. Do you not want an average? Um, you, even if you normalized it, if, I mean, if you're sending this to a machine learning algorithm, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, 
if you normalize it or don't normalize it, it's the same thing. Like either, either you're taking the sum or you're taking the average. Well, well cause when I, you also have to send then, you know, how many steps because you're just adding up an arbitrary number of entropy values, right? And then all, but it's always the same, right? It's always n minus one values. Sorry, n, <laughs> n values. So the machine learning algorithm knows what n is. Right? Sure. Okay. Even if it doesn't, though, I mean, it knows as long as they're, it's constant what you're taking the values over. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's right. You know, you're right. I thought it would be like different. I guess if it's all one second, then yeah. Yeah, essentially, yeah. It's like if n is forty-four thousand, it's always forty-four thousand you're taking across. Yeah, exactly. If you ever, if you're fluctuating that and changing that with, then you'd want an entry. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd want your entry rate. But really what this is trying to capture is how erratic that FFT is, right? And that might be good for like a clap, distinguishing a clap from like a, a knock. The centroid. This is a good one. Let's say you've got the FFT right here. You just multiply the current index times the magnitude of the FFT squared. And you sum them up and normalize the whole thing by the FFT squared. Oh, you've never seen the centroid before? No. I've never seen it. This is if if you ever if if you guys took a physics class in high school and you're trying to find the centroid of something, you just take the index of it and you multiplied the index times the value that it was at. You sum them all up and then normalize it, and that's essentially the centroid. It just tells you where most of the energy in the FFT, where in the index it lies, right? Like taking the whole thing as, as a mass. Bandwidth, you, you subtract off the centroid, and you essentially kind of look for what's the spread around the centroid. How far does it go? Flux, what is that? This is actually take so notice in here that you, you're taking f sub t of j minus f sub t minus one of j, right? So this FFT, the last FFT, I take the difference in the bins, right? So it's telling you a little bit how the FFT is changing over time, how that frequency is changing over time, and then spectral roll off. This is a good one. Um, you take the Maximum of h for j equals 1 to h such that f of t at the j is less than some kind of threshold. Okay, This one is a little bit different to use, but um, it's essentially trying to tell you in the spectrum where it falls off, where that basic fall off in the spectrum is, right? so where, the, um, where most of the sound concentration is. Okay, so these are all good features that you might want to use, right? So just to make sure everything's clear, let's say we've got spectral flux right here. This would be a spectrogram, right? Where I have the FFT at each given time, right? So this is frequency and this is time down here, right? So F sub zero corresponds to this point right here. And then I have F sub one, F sub two, all the way over to F sub cap T. All right, so that's where you get these f sub t values. So each vector is a different time slice that you're taking the FFT of. And then over here, I hold t constant, and I have j go from 1 to cap n. All right, so this would be an n point FFT. Yeah? Good? All right. So that's the index of the teeth vector basically denotes the frequency bin that we're at. All right, let's talk about speech recognition. Recognizing speech is really, really hard. It's only recently that people have gotten really, really good at it, to be honest. Why? Um, it's because our brains are optimized to interpret speech. Everybody's brain is. It is one of the things that humans and some primates are optimized for. It's what the brain does best, that and visual assessment. So the human ear has an unbelievable amount of resources. It's not just the eardrum, 
and we'll talk about that here in just a second. But speech recognition essentially tries to emulate human processing with their processing, right? So anything that we can look at in the biology of how humans process speech, we want to try and emulate that with our machine learning, with our signal processing, whatever it might be. So how does a human recognize speech? Um, the first thing you're ear does is it filters the sound and breaks it down by frequency. Okay, So it essentially takes an FFT of the incoming data. And we'll talk about how. Um, then there's some low-level processing and it tries to recognize familiar sounds. Okay, So it's going to recognize things that, it's, things that it has heard before. Okay, If you've never heard a sound before, your brain is not primed to recognize it. Right? That is why people of, uh, there are some languages where people from those cultures can recognize two different sounds. When you play them for a non-native speaker, it sounds like the exact same sound. Okay? Then, logical thought fills in all of the uncertainty. Okay? So if I were to say to you, um, this class is almost plover, what did I just say? I did. I said this class is almost clover, but what did I mean? And how did you know that? Magic. Because you're really, because the whole context, why would I say this class is clover? It doesn't make any sense. That's, that is what I said, but it's not what I meant. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Not necessarily in that particular instance, I'm saying in general, you interpolate things that, you know, have biases. Yes, absolutely. But all of those biases usually make sense. They help you make sense of the world, right? Your own, your own <laughs> circle, so, um, this right here, this process, this is what machine learning tries to do. It also, current machine learning methods neglect one really, really, really big factor of the brain. For every... For every one nerve ending that shoots up, right? So if you look at like the synapses and the way that it goes through the brain, as it goes from the ear to the center of the brain, for every one signal that goes up, there are nine more signals that go back down, right? This. Constantly changing the way that the ear is doing things. All of those signals exist in the brain. Machine learning, even modern machine learning, does not do that right now. They would love to be able to figure out how to do that, but it's not working right now. It's, it's just not there. Okay? Speech production. All right, let's talk about speech production. How do you produce speech? Um, well, how many, guys have, how many of you guys have heard of the glottis? What's the glottis? Growth. Growth. <laughs> it's, it's, it's essentially like right at the base of the vocal tract. There's a set of muscles that can close or open. That is all they do, right? And the duration that they can open and close determines your pitch. Those are vocal cords, right? Uh, it is right below the vocal cords. It's part of the vocal cord. Yeah. The glottis is what's slamming and opening shut. Um, so... Basically, you have the lungs that are pushing up against the glottis. They control the rate of air, how fast it comes out. Then that connects to your vocal tract, right? Your vocal tract includes uh, the trachea, the back of the throat, your tongue position, your lip position, and also the position of your teeth. And you <laughs> humans can make an unbelievable amount of shapes with their vocal tract, okay? It essentially determines how you modulate that air that's coming out this quickly, how it gets modulated such that different resonances are excited. Okay? So essentially it looks like this. This, here's your glottis, right? And what it's putting out is a bunch of puffs of air, right? And it's coming out at this rate. It goes through your vocal tract, and when it comes out of your lips, it's this nice smooth function over frequency. Right? And it's not just the pitch that you're putting out, but depending on the shape of your vocal tract, it excites different resonances. 
right? Okay. So the most intuitive way to think about it is this. You have a balloon. This is your lungs. Okay. That balloon forces air into a tube. Okay. Then you have your glottis, which is this giant fan that goes in front of it. Right? And it's essentially, it's when we're allowing air to come out. And it spins really, really, really fast. All right? Like 300 hertz. All right? So it's allowing all of that puffs to come through. And then it takes that. Oh, this is what determines your pitch, by the way, the glottis. Right? So it takes that and it puts it through the vocal tract. And the vocal tract is just a series of long tubes. Have you ever blown through a tube before? What happens? What else happens? What if you blew through a recorder? You guys remember recorders? It resonates, okay, depending on the length of the tube, right? And it has these different resonances, right? So even though you're just pumping a bunch of little bursts of air through it, it resonates at a certain frequency, depending on the shape of the vocal tract. So your vocal tract can have a bunch of different shapes, and for the most part, you get three different resonances that you can excite on different positions of your vocal tract. Okay? So your vocal tract changes shape and you get different resonances out. In the same way that as you change the shape or you cut off a recorder, it resonates at a different pitch. Okay? So that gives rise to what are called speech formants, right? So there's three frequencies that your vocal tract can resonate at, F1, F2, and F3, and the position of those changes depending on what you're trying to say, okay? So, this is the position of the vocal tract when you're trying to say E, as in heat, or put, uh, uh. Eh, as in head. Ah, as in call. Ah. If you look at the output over frequency, for when you say ah, it has these different formats. For when you say e, it looks like this. Ooh, in frequency, it looks like this. Okay, these are called different formats. Formants only exist for vowels. A, A, E, O, U. Okay? It's the only thing where your pitch comes through. If I start talking to you in nothing but consonants, you would have no idea what the pitch of my voice was. I don't know how to do that, but if I, if I did, I would do it. Okay? Growl? Yeah. It's still got an owl no, it's in it. You actually growl. Like, you want me to growl in class? No, I, I, I really don't want you to. <laughs> well, you could growl. I've never, I've never heard that before. Okay, all right, that's good. Maybe next time I'll practice and then I'll come back for it. <laughs> so there's a lot of different formats and vowel sounds that you can get. So you have here hot, hat, hit, head, and then, oh, I didn't write the other ones down, so I don't know what they are, but um, yeah, there's a lot of different things. Okay, what other sounds do you make other than vowel sounds? Consonants. So, if you want to break this down linguistically, those are called fricatives and plosives. So a fricative, what? Ah, so what's a fricative? Do you know? Do you remember? That's okay. Well, a fricative is something, it's essentially when you're just, you're not using your glottis anymore. Your glottis goes wide open and it just allows all of the air to come through. <laughs> so when you're doing something like sss or shh, you're essentially just forcing that air through these different kind of crevices in your mouth to make different tones, right? So the glot you, there's no pitch when I say s s s all right? But you still understand that those are the different sounds that they get made. Plosives are things like p and t. It's essentially when you push air up against one of the cavities in your vocal tract and you stop that air from coming and then let it all out at one time. So like with a, the letter P, all of that air gets pushed up against the lips and then it gets forced out. So, or if you say t, t, you do it with your tongue. I think there's another one. There, k, 
Vedanta is at the back of the throat. Okay? So that's a plosive or fricative. Those look very different if we were to look at it on the spectrogram. So this is a spectrogram of someone saying, children like strawberries. All right? So we have t, right? It's a, it, when you say a plosive or a fricative, it takes up the entire frequency spectrum, right? So if I were to say ch, like this, it takes up the entire frequency spectrum. Then the ill right here in ildren, children, that vowel sound, it starts to come out where you see the different formants in the vowels, right? And then there's dr right here, dr, r, z, s. Okay? And then there's H, which H has no clue what it wants to sound like. H will sound like whatever letter comes after it. Okay, so if you say hi or ha or ho, it will it will take on the structure of the vowel sound that comes after it. Yeah. What? Ah. Why do they do it in Great Britain? We don't do it so much of the time here in English language. In Great Britain, they're like they see an H and they've got to say it, like herbs. <laughs> Herbs, herbal, herbal, herbal. Guten tag, y'all. All right. So, the ears, I told you that they take an FFT of the signal. All right. Do you believe me? All right. So, here's the parts of the ear. You've got the eardrum, which is right here, and it vibrates back and forth. You know what its main function is? To amplify sound. It doesn't do any analysis by itself. It amplifies sound and then sends it into this long bone-like thing right here called the cochlea. Okay? The cochlea is this long bone-like part, and there's a bunch of nerves that come off of all the sides of the cochlea. Here, let's zoom in. This is what the cochlea looks like, and it has brain, en brain nerve endings that go up, and they're connected all along this line. It turns out this part of the cochlea is most sensitive to 20,000 hertz, the upper range of human hearing. And as you go down this cochlea, this is a mechanical FFT that it does. It's exciting different parts of the cochlea, and they resonate and vibrate for different frequencies, and those signals get sent up to the brain. Is yeah. it the cochlea that hurts from loud noises? Like it's the eardrum. The eardrum hurts. The eardrum hurts from loud noises. The cochlea usually doesn't break. If there's something wrong with the cochlea, that usually happens at birth, which is why you'll have things like cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are where they say, okay, the cochlea doesn't work. We're going to attach electrodes all along the cochlea. And we're going to, you know, as sound comes in, we're going to break it down by frequencies and send it to the proper place on the cochlea. Right? It doesn't sound right. It's like, but it, it the brain learns to interpret that. You guys ever heard of cochlear implants? So it just sends different signals to a machine learning algorithm in your brain, basically? Yes. Your brain is the ultimate machine learning algorithm. You can give it anything, and it will learn how to interpret it. It's pretty cool. Have you ever heard of the like, simulation of what it sounds like with the cochlear implants? Yes, I have. My advisor created cochlear implants a long time ago, and so I had to go through so many <laughs> talks and things where he was going through the stuff, and it's, it's bizarre. It sounds really weird. Yeah. For people that, for people, they learn to interpret it. Yeah, I, I there was a TED talk about a guy that they they did the same thing with color. They interpreted color and put it differently on the cochlea because he was colorblind, and he was able to look at something and interpret color different. Yeah. Yeah, like think about that. It's, it's the same thing. Like we could all right now be what we've seen different colors, but because we've seen them since we were little, and like we associated that whatever we see right now is brown, whatever we see is pink. Like you, we think it's like that. It's something like. The person next to us could be seeing a completely different color, but we would never know because that's how they associate it in the brain. That is true. Man, we've gotten into philosophy in this class now. This is awesome. <laughs> this is great. How are we doing on time? <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is the same thing that the ear does. We're going to take an FFT <coughs> over time. Okay, but maybe we could be a little bit smarter about the way that we take our FFT. 
All right, so this is someone saying Bill Jones from Colorado. All right, found this on the interwebs. The ears do not process all, process all frequencies equally. Neither should we, right? They group frequencies according to this thing called the Mel scale. And the Mel scale, it essentially takes um, different frequencies and averages them together. So when you're at lower frequencies, it'll group a small number of frequencies together and add them up. When you get to higher frequencies, you'll take a lot of different frequencies, the magnitudes of them, and add them up. So essentially, what you've done here is you've taken this FFT, which is, I don't know, of size 2048, and you average across it according to the Mel scale like this, and you can get it down to something like 13 coefficients. Right? And this is good enough for speech recognition. All right? So we emulate what the ear does on the cochlea. Break it down into 13 different bands. Now what we want to do is classify these things called phonemes. What are phonemes? Have you ever heard of a phoneme? Yeah. So like for the English language, there's just a bunch of different sounds that make up everything else. Right? It's not the alphabet because you can make a lot more sounds than all of the things that are in the alphabet, right? There's something like 80 or some, I can't remember how many phonemes there are, but there's a lot of different phonemes of sounds you can make. Like, so, ch, ch, those are phonemes, right? D, a, a. <laughs> Look, ton phonics, yes. Interesting. That's cool. Um, so we can use these male scaled coefficients. We have 13 coefficients for every uh, every kind of uh, window in time, and we're going to use those to try and figure out what phoneme is being said. Right. Once we know the phonemes, we can put it together as a word. Right. Um, the most common. They don't actually. When you do speech recognition, most recognition systems do not just take these male scaled coefficients. They use something called Kepstra which is a play on the word spectra. Um, so you might see things like MFCCs, which are uh, MEL frequency capstral coefficients or linear predictive capstral coefficients. Um, and essentially what you do is, let's say you have some window of, of time, right? Some window, you have some, some signal F of T. The first thing you do is take the F of T of it, right? That's not so bad. Right? We've done that before. You take a, a signal and take the FFT. Then you take the magnitude of it. That's okay. Then you take the log of it. Okay, it's kind of converting it over to like a decibel scale. right? And then you take the inverse FFT. Back in time domain. It's a little weird. Um, there's actually not a really great uh, physical explanation of why you do this. Uh, it's mostly the statistics on how it works out. Um, but essentially what you're doing is, so do you remember how convolution turned into multiplication on the FFT? Well, if you take the log of something, two things that are multiplied, what does that turn into? Addition. So essentially, when you when you convert something over using this, the capstral coefficients, uh, you turn convolution into addition in that domain. And so you can separate out what the vocal tract is doing from what's exciting it. It's kind of what's going on right there. But that's not 100% true. Anyway, I just wanted to mention it. You don't have to know. So essentially, we go from our spectrogram to something like this, where we have uh, like 9 to 13 coefficients here. And now we want to recognize the phonemes that are here, right? So what is this? What is it? Yeah, hold me now. Great, perfect. Right, so if we can recognize these phonemes, we can get to these words. All right. This is where logical thought tries to fill in the uncertainty that we have. 
All right. So if we want to recognize the phonemes, we want to use structured machine learning, right? So I don't just want to use this one slice of time in these 13 capsular coefficients to try and figure out what that phoneme is. I want to use all the phonemes that I see, right? And I want to come up with the set of phonemes that is most likely to explain all of the capsular coefficients that I'm seeing, right? Not just one to one, the whole thing. So I'm going to use a linear chain model. Okay, which essentially says each of these states needs to be classified as a phoneme. So what I want to do is I want to jointly optimize this based on what I know, based on the observed features that I have, and the most likely sequence that this should go through. Right? And once I do that, Then I can take that up to here, and I can run another machine learning algorithm on it. And let's say I want to split up the different phonemes that I found this way. Let's say this is a phoneme, this is one, this is another one, here's another. I want to turn those phonemes into words. Right? So I have another classification that I want to run, which is another structured machine learning that based on the phonemes that I have, what's the most likeliest word sequence that puts those phonemes together? And I can put that together. So it's a hierarchy of linear chain models. The most common one is going to be hidden Markov model. But it's not all that useful. People don't really use it all that much anymore. Yeah? Don't you get the probabilities from the words to determine phoneme order? So the, the probabilities for going through the, the decoding is relatively common? Well, if you have the transitions of the phonemes, then that's the same as the transitions for the words. Exactly. So if you have, it's not like, it's not like a step-by-step -step thing, right? It's done jointly at the same time. So the words and the phonemes. Yes. Yep. Okay. And, and actually, so this, I mean, you could just draw this model drawn out this way. And the fact that an arrow exists um, means that you can, you'll be able to jointly optimize over both. Yeah. Um, this is probably about the complexity that Open Ears uses. Okay, that the API that I mentioned that was free, it probably does something very, very similar to this. Goes up to the hidden Markov models, right? Um, but you can imagine getting more complicated. What if you didn't want to just know this word based on the last word, but you also wanted to know this word based on the last two words that were there? Bring a three gram model together, right? We could start to make this get a little more complicated, right? Because even though this might do pretty well at recognizing speech, what about different pitch that people have? People sound, people sound different than one another, right? What about dialect? What about accent? What about pronunciation in the English language? What about grammar models, nouns and verbs? What about noisy environments when we're not really getting all of the observations to be correct, right? Context, like conversation, or are we doing search? These are all really big problems that you're not going to be able to run locally on a phone. So you probably need a slightly more complicated model that you can look at over time that takes into account all sorts of different things. Are you going to create that on your own? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't try it. That's all I have on speech recognition. Um, if you are interested in looking at these models right here, this is called a dynamic graphical model. Um, and you could look at something called GMTK or Graph Lab. Um, and both of those are, are pretty good methodologies for putting together something like this. If you're interested in it, that would be the next step to look at. For next time, no class. But Monday, a week from this Monday, I'll give another lecture on pitching and presenting. But we are basically done now with all iOS in this course. Questions? Comments? <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs>